Welcome uh, to Inside the Outhouse for yet another conversation this evening, a conversation which I'm very excited about. My name is Peter Smith. I'm uh, the founder, orator and telemark of this wild event. Um, just before handing over to Mads to introduce the conversation this week, there's a few things I want to say. Um, based on some experiences I've had this week, I guess, personally, uh, be kind to other humans, my first thing. Um, be well and keep laughing in this time. And climate change is real. Let's all do our part. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Mads. Thanks, Mads. Ooh. Um, so I'd like to kick things off tonight with um, our acknowledgement of country. So let's take a little minute. Um, we respect and honour Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, elders past, present and future. Let's take a moment to acknowledge the stories, traditions and living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on this land and commit to building a brighter future together. I'm personally on Wurundjeri land tonight and I would like to particularly pay my respects to Wurundjeri elders past, present and emerging. Um, if everybody could take a little moment to figure out if you don't already know um, what country you're on and just drop it in the chat, that would be great. Um, before we get uh, into everything, this topic on um, queer inclusion kind of sparked some practices um, for us to like have a look at um, and start including from this session onwards. Uh, we came to the conclusion that um, we're going to start um, including our pronouns in our names. So if you need help changing to changing your name to include your pronouns, you can just go up to your little video screen and you can click on the little dots um, and then you'll have an option to change name and then you can just add it in brackets, the pronouns that you'd like to go by. Um, tonight we are fortunate to have Riley Edwards from Climbing Cuties joining us and we'll be speaking on the topic of queer inclusion in the outdoors. Welcome Riley. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, should I just get started and share my screen and go for it? Okay, great. Hi everyone, I can't see your faces, so if you want to, you can pop your video on because that'll be nice for me, but that's fine. I'm sure we're all used to Zoom. Um, so I'm gonna go through some slides and talk about LGBTQ inclusion in um, the outdoors. Um, I work in the climbing, rock climbing space, so that's sort of the angle that I'll be coming from. But um, yeah, and then we'll have some time for questions, I believe as well. But if you do have some pressing questions, then feel free to add them into the chat and I'll try and keep an eye on that as well. So. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Climbing Cuties, but we're an LGBTQ inclusive uh, rock climbing club. Um, I'm Riley Edwards, my pronouns are they and them, and I'm the, one of the founders and the current president of Climbing Cuties. So before I'd like to get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Woiwurrung people. This content was developed on those lands and um, we're actually spread across Australia in terms of the activities and the programs that we run as well. So um, definitely want to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands in which we um, deliver programs and partake in rock climbing as well. So in terms of QTs itself, um, we've been running since early 2018. We started up as a little bit of a, a meetup at the local climbing gym here in Melbourne in Nam. Um, had like, you know, 20 to 30 people that came up, but now we have over 470 members that are part of our group. So um, we have, uh, yeah, members that pay to be a part of the club. So that's 470 people. And then we have people that just participate in a, in a variety of ways, whether it's through Facebook or just coming along to our events. We're a, rock climbing club and an advocacy group and we also are inclusive of allies so you don't have to identify as part of the club to participate in the programs that we run and we run everything from meetups at the local climbing gym um, and outdoor trips as well so we run camps and trad courses and outdoor top roping trips and overnight camps as well um, we currently have a presence in victoria in New South Wales, in Queensland, and in ACT as well. Unfortunately, only Queensland is doing activities at the moment, so we're channeling all our energy into that space. Um, and we have a little bit of a, a, a side sort of project happening in the UK and um, talking about starting something in Singapore as well, which is exciting. So we're potentially going national, international. Um, in terms of what we sort of aim to do, it's mostly about addressing, I guess, inclusive spaces in rock climbing, just realizing that people with their diverse sexualities and identities and gender identities all have a different sort of need to be able to feel included and welcome in queer sports spaces um, and trying to break down some of those barriers so everyone can access rock climbing in the outdoors um, 
and we're all about creating inclusive environments. So allies has always been part of our narrative to make sure that everyone can get involved because leave space for people that are questioning their gender or might not be out about their sexuality. And we just realize that allies play a key role in a lot of the work that we do. So in terms of our values, I've just got a little snapshot on the screen. Um, I think this will be recorded so you can look at it later, but it's also listed on our website as well. So you can head over to climbingkitties.com to have a look, but we really focus on inclusion. So creating those safe spaces, whether it's at the gym or at the crag, and then also visibility. So uplifting LGBTQ identities, giving them leadership opportunities, offering training, um, making sure that our ambassadors are members of the community as well. And if we work with partners and um, brands as well, making sure that we can increase the visibility of LGBTQ folk access. So that includes um, physical access as well, as well as financial access. I think a lot of us will know that um, climbing can be pretty expensive to participate in. So making sure our events are really affordable and we can offer whether it's free tickets or discounted equipment or free access to um, trips and tours if possible. And then education, so sessions like this, but also um, we run ally training sessions for people and um, making sure that we can get people that are decision makers and leaders in the outdoors and climbing sector educated on the needs and I guess the unique requirements to be able to support everyone's access to climbing. And I was told to pop this in, so we've got a couple awards through Pride and Sport, which is, I guess, um, yeah, part of our sort of strategy to be able to increase the visibility of LGBTQ folks. So we got an award in 2020 and 2021 and then we've also worked with um, a couple of businesses and brands as well. So I'm not sure if you're aware of Blockhouse Bouldering, but they also won some awards last year, which is pretty proud of us. Uh, this is just a cute photo of Tara in Durat at Rapley. <laughs> so I'm also gonna go through a couple, I guess, projects that we sort of led and, you know, led to sort of create some change within the space. So in, in 2020, we supported um, Sport Climbing Victoria to host their first um, lead state titles and they included the, a separate category for an inclusive category to support trans and gender diverse people. They gave us a nice rainbow um, uh, gold medal thingy, which was nice. So um, yeah, just an example of some of the work that we do, which inc includes supporting people to write new policies and create new po competition formats so everyone can get involved. And although the people that participated in this category can't qualify for anything at the state level it just means that they could participate in a competition which is like the most important thing for us so yeah we sponsored some of our athletes to uh, attend and then we supported um, the actual delivery of the event as well and then in um, early 2020 as well a lot of stuff that <laughs> we had to do online unfortunately I'm sure we understand why um, so Ida Hobbit International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Interphobia and Transphobia we hosted a virtual event we had lots of virtual guests that attended. And this is, I guess, part of one of those initiatives where we try and support and uplift the visibility of LGBTQ folk in climbing. And we had people like Alex Johnson from the US tune in as well. So really great, um, awesome speakers that just kind of told their stories about what it was like to be climbing and part of the queer community. Um, so yeah, sometimes we do virtual things and we might have to do more of them more recently. And then, we also hosted our first sort of trans cuties, uh, which is a separate subgroup of climbing cuties. Um, so it's for trans and gender diverse people specifically. Um, so we were supported by um, Transgender Victoria to run a, a peer support program. And then at the end of the program, participants were taken to Durite um, to Mount Arapiles on a three day trip to go climbing outdoors, which was really exciting. So that's a cute little photo of them. Um, but yeah, we are recognized that the trans community are. Uh, I guess, subject to a specific set of sort of discrimination and um, they're still marginalized in very different ways. And so they may need extra sort of support to feel uplifted and be able to participate in outdoor activities. We also run uh, courses. So one example is um, the a trad lead course. So the first one we delivered was in the start of this year and we've got a few more hopefully that'll happen once the climbing season starts and lockdown ends. Um, so courses that are run by LGBTQ folk and um, delivered to LGBTQ folk so that people can, you know, upskill and we work with the climbing guides and the certified um, climbing instructor school so that we can offer them really cheap and accessibly and support, yeah, their whole experience when they go outdoors. I think a lot of people potentially take for granted um, 
the access to outdoor spaces, whether it's like knowing what a sleeping mat is or like how to set up a tent or where the bathrooms are, all those things we kind of just assume that everyone has access to and a lot of people don't necessarily have the skills to um, participate. So that's another example of what we do. So I guess why is LGBTQ inclusion important? Um, I think a lot of us here probably understand why diversity and inclusion is important and the fact that you're here is a really great sign for that. But um, yeah, we, we have, I guess, a, a few key points in terms of why we sort of uh, do the work that we do and what sort of drives our strategy year by year. Um, so some of that includes, um, I guess, a lack of physical and social activities and opportunities that specifically target the LGBTI community. And a lot of people need extra support to sort of take that first step to participate in something that can often seem a little bit intimidating or scary, or, or if they don't see role models of, of people that look like themselves, they might not feel like it's a space that they can belong in. Um, access and inclusion, which I talked about before, but also like in terms of creating like a, a social space that feels psychologically safe for people as well if they don't feel like um, it's a welcome space for them then they might not feel safe mentally and then that means that they can't participate in a physical space that could be challenging so breaking down those barriers as well um, in terms of visible represent representation um, making sure that we can sort of um, increase the visibility of lots of different types of people that participate so we're not dominated by uh, one specific type of person in the outdoor spaces and then recognizing that the outdoors is for everyone. So I think it's all part of our mission to do that work. So I've got a few, I guess, key issues on the screen there, which you can take a look at. Um, these are pulled from um, research that we've found. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of research that's specific to LGBTQ inclusion and participation in climbing specifically or specifically to Australia, but we did find some research that included um, sports that included bouldering as well. So it is quite relevant to the work that we do and hopefully there'll be more research in the future. Um, but just that statistic on the top left alone in regards to 54% of trans people feeling like they can't participate because of their gender identity. Um, yeah, something that we're really trying to focus on and make sure that we can you know, reduce that statistic. Um, and also intersectionality. So I guess we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do without an understanding that outdoors recreation spaces are still really predominantly whitewashed. And um, we have to understand that we can't do the work we do without reconciliation. So that's always been a part of the work that we do. So we also run workshops for um, uh, reconciliation reflection sessions. And we work with the Garrywood Romero Reconciliation Network here specifically to run those for people that we introduce to the outdoors. I think our main demographic of audience is um, people that are new to climbing or, you know, we're aware that we're taking people outdoors for the first time. So it's really in our best interest to make sure that people understand what that means and what respect for land and country and traditional owners means when they're going and enjoying those outdoor spaces. So that's threaded through everything that we do and we make sure that we share that information in all the, um, I guess, yeah, pre-event information when we take people outdoors. Um, so yeah, just wanted to add that in there because I think that's uh, definitely key to some of the work and the advocacy work we do as well. And in terms of privilege, I suppose this is a slide that I have in one of our training sessions, but um, we do ask people to, I guess, do a bit of a privilege check when they participate or, you know, if, if they do participate in training with us, understanding that some of those complex identities that are listed on the screen there, like they have people have like a, an intersecting sort of lived experience of what it's like to participate in sports and climbing. And so that means that, you know, this layer of being non-binary or being a person with minimum wage or someone with a disability or someone who's um, bisexual potentially, you know, they, all of these sort of like add additional barriers to someone's identity and then can create like more and more walls and barriers to be able to access climbing in the outdoors. So. It, it seems like um, a lot of the work that we do is celebrations and pride events and recognition and visibility and parties, but uh, it's a lot of difficult conversations as well. And I think that um, the more sort of brave we feel about tackling these topics, the, the more space we'll be able to create for people. Um, and then I also do like to remind people that we do have, um, uh, I guess, a sex discrimination act that backs up the work that we do. So if you know you ever felt like it was 
even though we know it's the right thing to do if we ever feel like it's a difficult piece or if you feel like there might be pushback or someone that's going to say why are you doing the work that you're doing you have the law to back you up and um, you have groups like us that will help you advocate for a lot of the changes and we still have a lot of work to do in this space unfortunately I think one example is that the um, uh, same-sex marriage was only legalized in 2017 so if you think about that in the grand scheme of things it's really quite recent so um, although I live in a nice little little bubble in inner city Melbourne at the moment um, and a lot of the people that I uh, spend time with have similar views to me I think there's a lot of people that don't agree with a lot of the work that we do so yeah, the law has your back and we've got your back if you did have any questions and you know you weren't sure about some of the changes that you were making or some of the work that you wanted to do or the advocacy work, um, you've got people to talk to. Um, and then I just wanted to pop this up here, I guess, maybe an opportunity to ask the group as well if people feel brave enough to um, chat and um, help me break down the fact that I'm the only person talking right now. So uh, does anyone know what uh, a microaggression is or understand what that term means? Anyone? Hey, Riley, it's it's Hugh here. Um, we've been fortunate enough to chat a couple of times by by phone. Um, oh, hey. Yeah. Hey, um, I'm sorry I can't, other than helping out by speaking for a and demonstrating my ignorance publicly, I, I don't... Um, <laughs> know what micro microaggressions are but I'd love to yeah cool. sure I'll give you I'll give everyone a dictionary definition so um, a microaggression is a term used for brief and commonplace daily verbal behavioral and environmental indignities that uh, may be intentional or unintentional and they can communicate hostile derogatory or negative attitudes towards uh, stigmatized groups so in this case we're talking about the LGBTI community but it can also be to any any sort of stigmatized or minor minority uh, marginalized group as well so um i get i can give you one example so one example would be like the phrase oh that's so gay which i think we've definitely heard in the past we don't hear so much anymore but stuff that might be thrown around sort of on the footy field um used like the gay the term gay being used as an insult towards other people but kind of as a joke i suppose um but can anyone think of any other examples maybe relevant to like our sort of outdoors and, and climbing space that would be relevant to um homophobia, biphobia, or transphobia. Any other examples? Think about some of the stereotypes that exist in regards to LGBTQ folk and... Um... I had one today, actually. It's more about, like, a tying someone's sexuality to just crappy behaviour. So it's like, I've got nothing against gay people, but, you know, lumps in with... I think today that was something along the lines of got nothing against gay people, but I've only had I've had so many problems since they started working mm. here. And so it's like wow, putting that's... one specific person's crappy behaviour on across a whole spread. Yeah. Of, um, yeah. That sounds that sounds pretty blatant, but yeah, I would yeah, I guess you'd consider that a microaggression as well. <laughs> but I'm sorry that happened. <laughs> I hope that was the okay situation for you. Does anyone else um anything else come to mind for anyone? It could even be sort of um, something that, a, I guess, a business or an organisation does. It doesn't necessarily have to be from person to person. So a simple example is when we work with climbing gyms before we partner to work with them, we just make sure that if they are asking for gender or sex information on their sort of liability forms or whatever information that they have, that they're, they're inclusive of, of trans and gender diverse identities. So it's not just male and female, because that would be considered a transphobic microaggression because it's excluding um, trans and gender diverse folk. Um, even if it's something that they unintentionally do, uh, we just ask people to, yeah, I guess, create more inclusive spaces that way. Does that feel relevant to people as well? Yeah. Any other examples? Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, I feel like uh, where maybe I've happened into situations where there's been gender diverse persons on, on a program mm. um, and then like the question of like um, sleeping arrangements comes up um, and then turns into a, a tough conversation that maybe otherwise shouldn't be so, such a tough conversation. I feel like maybe that could fit into this. Yeah, I think so too. And even even um, when I work with um, some of the gyms when we do events, 
um, you know, looking at someone and saying, oh, if they're asking for a bathroom or change room facility and making an observation and then immediately directing them to just one facility. You know, we want to make sure that we're not making assumptions about people's gender or sexuality or what sort of facility they want to use based on their appearance. So that would be considered, I guess, like an unintentional micro microaggression because it's making assumptions about people and then all the other other choices in their life. So I will advise people to say, you know, offer them up the option of going to any facility that they choose rather than saying, oh, you look female, so I'm going to point you to the female bathroom. Anyway, just some food for thought if you wanted to have a think about these things, because this is often how we get people to sort of stand up as allies um, in their sort of everyday situation, because it might be your friends or um, it might be someone that you know and you, you know, you respect, but says something that might be considered inappropriate and really deeply affect um, that someone that's part of our community. Can I, can I just make a comment before you go on? Yes. Yes, um, I guess in, in the world of, uh, shall we generalize, outdoor programming, I, I think there's, there's often a, an unfortunate two uh, gender assumption made um, in the programming space. And uh, I, I, I think that limits, uh, it, it, it basically is a microaggression because basically it, 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 it doesn't give people scope to... Uh, step out of that traditional to male female kind of mm. stereotyping yeah absolutely um that also reminds me of a situation where a climbing gym had upload, uploaded some social media content and they'd reset some walls and they they called the uh, the roof climb the man cave and then the this corner slabby section the ladies corner and it was like that's not appropriate because you're just making assumptions about what people were capable of doing how are women going to climb you know steep amazing you know walls if you can consider that the man cave and that's just a phrase that they use but uh, just one example of how we can sort of lead into you know people people's ideas and themselves are really very much influenced by the work that we do so yeah great example from your part as well I know I'm running out of time which is why I'm like rushing to get through some of the slides so I'm going to quickly go through the the rest Thank and then we'll time. have questions <laughs> so um just wanted to put up some keys I guess like examples of how we can create um, affirmative spaces. So an affirmative space is basically a space that um, allows someone to feel welcome with a number of key factors that come into play. So this is just a photo with um, uh, Blockhouse Marrickville in, in New South Wales that we've worked with. And so we've worked with them for over a year. We're in our second year uh, partnership with them now and includes a lot of the behind the scenes work and then eventually we've been able to do a lot of the advocacy work that does connect with community and you know we had something like the little something as simple as like the little rainbow um, sign on the wall and then having t-shirts for staff as well just sort of publicly signals that LGBTQ folk are welcome in these spaces but it definitely goes beyond um, just having bathrooms and physical spaces we know it's all about visible allyship and just having the doors open and saying oh we don't care who comes and goes you know that doesn't matter it's a completely different story to saying no we really want you in the space and we're going to put the work in to make sure that you feel invited and welcome um, because even when we run events here in, in uh, Victoria, when we have the meetups, I'll always get a number of people messaging us on Facebook or Instagram saying, hey, I really want to come to a meetup, but I'm really nervous and scared. Um, and then, you know, we have our champions on the ground who um, will have to like leave the venue, meet them on the street and help them walk into the space and sign up because it takes a little bit of extra work just to do that. So it's that sort of invitation that we really feel like needs to happen um, and I think people who um, organize events and run, run venues it's kind of their responsibility to do that as well. So in terms of facilities and events um, some key things that you can do if you whether you know you work in that space or you um, I guess want to influence someone else to be able to do some of the work that that they can do as well so um, we do um, offer up the advice that you should clean up your backyard before inviting people into your home. So making sure you do the behind the scenes admin before um, just putting up the rainbow logo, which we see a lot of in Pride Month in June. But um, <laughs> that if that's been done, then, you know, there's um, other ways to create inclusion, whether it's through that sort of signaling of putting up pride flags and making sure your staff have participated in training of some sort. Speaking to the community rather than just assuming, um, you know, what we want because we're all so different and groups like Climbing Cuties, we have a, uh, I guess, a, a number of people that are part of our working group and we would like to think that they're quite diverse and we consult with them before making any major decisions so you can connect with communities uh, that way as well. 
and then making sure the inclusion work that you're doing has a flow on effect. So everything from behind the scenes to your communications, to the website, to sort of, I guess, the admin and the data and everything that you do. So it's not just kind of tokenistic in the work that you do. Um, Ali, and I think as, sorry, Riley, um, can I ask yes. what, what, uh, what ally training is actually available? Is it, um, run through a government process or grants or through independent yeah. organizations and and how do you access that and where do you go to find those those links yeah you can so there, i guess there's a number of training opportunities available um nationally through community groups like climbing cuties but we do offer a two-hour ally training session um so in terms of, I guess, my qualifications, I've worked as a diversity inclusion coordinator in the higher education space. And I also work as an educator and advocate at a health organization. And so, yeah, we have, um, we've developed a two hour training module, which is specific to the outdoors and climbing spaces. So if anyone's interested, they can get in touch with us and um, we can deliver that through Zoom, which we most likely will for a while now. But um, yeah, so um, training's available. And if it's outdoor specific, I think that we're the only groups that does that at the moment. So um, we go through everything in regards to understanding the difference between sex and gender and sexuality, and then um, giving people case studies to go through and then getting people to think about things like microaggressions. We put people into sort of breakout rooms to sort of workshop ideas in terms of how they can create inclusive spaces. Um, so yeah, people can get in touch with me if they like, I can send them some more information in regards to that. Um, here's a nice little group photo um, that I like to put up because this was one of our first sort of really large scale events that we hosted in um, here at uh, Northside Boulders. And this is one that I put up when people ask, oh, there's not enough queer people <laughs> because there are. <laughs> there's a lot of us out there and there's a lot of people that want to participate and get involved. And not to say everyone in this space is queer. There's a lot of straight people, you know, cis people in there as well. But it's, it's more that we definitely exist. And um, if you invite us in, we'll, we'll show up as well. Um, and I guess in terms of strategy, I just wanted to share a, a few slides in terms of um, the type of strategic work that we can do as well. So in terms of, I guess, consulting with a business or partnering with um, a business. I don't know if this is entirely relevant, but yeah, so we, we provide um, analysis of how a business runs, um, including developing inclusion plans and strategies, and then also providing feedback um, and uh, support with I guess some form of like um, guidelines in terms of how they can support their community. I won't go into in too much detail, um, but offering support in terms of social circumstances is also really important because people are often worried about, you know, if I do put up a post, what if I get a complaint? What do I do in that situation? And often that's a bit of a barrier for people to start doing advocacy work. Um, and I've made them V grades for people who don't understand climbing, but anyway, I've put them up as like V5 to V9. Let's see if you're trying this hard, then this is what you'll be doing. So at this stage, then we, um, uh, after you've done the up to V4, <laughs> then you can start participating in, um, yeah, I guess accessing the community and engaging with the community because you've done all that behind the scenes work. So that includes um, bringing people into your space, also doing the education and training. You might want to uh, start putting out stuff through social media. So using inclusive language to do that as well. And then also we provide mentoring for um, LGBTQ folk within your business and organization so that they can be champions that represent the, the work that you're doing as well. And then things like creating your own rainbow uh, merchandise or logos and things. And then the last step, which is B10 plus, which is very extreme and I'm sure we're all crushes at this point. But um, this includes, um, yeah, I guess, design support for your own work that you're doing. So this is kind of going off and doing the work on your own. And then we can co-host events and uh, programs together. And then also providing advice in regards to hosting your events and programs and then um, if you'd like to creative campaigns and, and support with that as well. So if you wanted to do a big campaign for Pride Month or any other date of significance, we're happy to support. And that's a nice picture of Pat behind the boulder saying goodbye because that's the end of that section. And these are my details if you want to get in touch with me. And I've gone through all the slides really quickly, so now we have time for questions. <laughs> Wow, thank you for all of that, Riley. So detailed. And um, the training is like such a great resource, I think, for organisations who don't know where to start. Um, maybe they can, you know, reach out to Climbing Cuties and engage like even like just a few staff members in that training would be super powerful. Um, yeah. Execute change. 
yeah we um we also talk with athletes as well so um we can tailor sessions depending on who the audience is i'm doing a session with some north face athletes tomorrow which i'm really excited about but people from like snowboarding and from every uh, other sport i'm not sure and, and trail running and all that so um yeah we can definitely tailor content it's in our best interest to get people to know why this work is important i suppose hugely powerful um i'm not sure if you mentioned but um now we might even just open it up to any maybe questions people have for their like individual practice in the outdoors how they can be more inclusive um and maybe even from an organizational perspective like or anything um, that you've got for Riley. We're also fortunate enough to have um, Lauren uh, from Proud to Play also here. Um, Proud to Play um, is a, correct me if I get any of this wrong, um, an inclusive, queer inclusive sporting um, body and they partner with a lot of um, sporting bodies, particularly in Victoria, but I think wider than that as well um, to help people be more inclusive in sport. So if you've got questions for either of these humans, then please. Uh, I've got one if, um, if I'm not gonna jump over the top of anyone. R Riley, you, you're obviously, I mean, obviously he's doing amazing work period, but if, if people like Arcteryx and the North Face are going to be supporting it, then, you, you know, again, there's there's really great sort of international big business endorsement. And I guess I was going to ask a very perhaps a slightly boring off topic logistical question about what, what was the experience of engaging those guys uh, like for you? Um, it was very exciting because I actually got an offer from North Face and Arcturus at the same time. And I was like, oh, no, I have to juggle both because they have, um, I guess, uh, yeah, we had to have a dis nice little discussion about who's going to do what um, because it's a contract, <laughs> an agreement of some sort. But I think that even in the in the brands that we work with, we've definitely said no to a couple of brands just based on the fact that the values don't align or some of the affiliation of the work that they've been doing that doesn't align with ours. So it's really great and we, we're really excited and happy to work with Arcteryx and North Face Um and looking forward to that sort of relationship growing but we also make it really clear to brands that you can't buy the queers and you can't sort of take ownership over the lgbt community you know we need to share the love around and if it's if it's advocacy work and if you're sort of um yeah supporting the community then it's we, we you know you would understand that we want to sort of reach as many people as possible and arcteryx and north face have been absolutely fantastic um some other brands have been a bit more challenging to work with um but yeah, I guess we're always flattered to be able to do that. And then also making sure that, you know, I'm like I'm doing the training tomorrow with North Face and um, making sure that even in the work that we do, we are sort of making sure that it, the behind the scenes work is being done as well. So we won't jump the gun and just suddenly work on a pride event with any brand unless we feel like we've developed a bit of a relationship. Because I think a lot of people in the LGBT community are used to being marginalized and discriminated against. And so it might take up take up a lot of um i guess it takes a bit of time to build trust with members of the community otherwise um they don't want to be disappointed once they get there and they feel like if we have a relationship with a brand um they kind of already have that trust built in so we want to be careful with who we work with i suppose thanks for that mate that's a really good insight into how it all sort of i guess hangs together yeah yeah So I could ask a question if I may. Um, I'm Dom, Courtney and myself are both here from Outdoors Queensland and we'd be very happy to help uh, sort of spread the word about climbing cuties in Queensland and the work that you're doing if that was of any, of any help, of any use. Yeah, that'd be great. Maybe pop your contact details in the chat and I can grab them off you. We're sure partnered with Sport Climbing Queensland, um, so they're supporting us to run the meetups there, but it's oh, um, good. we've only technically launched in the past few months, so the more sort of affiliation we can do, especially now because the Queensland events are the only ones happening. Everything has been postponed. Yeah, Queensland. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, for, for sure, let me know. Um, hopefully we can start to run some outdoor trips in Queensland as well. We've got some planned in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales soon, so hopefully those can go ahead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, 
I'll leave my details and we'll, we can talk later. Thank you. Riley, um, uh, so I'm based in Brisbane and I work for a school now uh, recently. Um, how are you finding engagement or um, uh, I guess take up of your training and or programs um, within the independent school or even the state government school sector? And given that there's a lot of people, a lot of young people um, who are under a lot of uh, mental health issues with the COVID uh, issue, issues at the moment, um, who obviously uh, are questioning their sexuality and you know, are looking for answers and, and help in that area. Um, how are you finding the school sector and the marketplace there um, is being receptive to your programs? Yeah, we have. Um, so in terms of the education and training, I don't think we've actually engaged with any schools or TAFEs or universities at, at all. So if you do have people that are interested or if you know who I can pass the info on to, definitely let me know because that would be great because we do have school aged and youth participate in our events. We have one person that travels um, six hours by bus on it from like out of regional Victoria just to come to our climbing cuties event. So people will, you know, go the distance to get involved and because that person wants to be an outdoor ed teacher and wants to be a climbing instructor and they, you know, know that this is one way to, you know, find a space and a sense of community. Um, most of the, the training and education we've been delivering and the consulting work has been to people, I guess, working whether it's at a um, yeah, climbing business or, you know, working, um, so climbing anchors, for example, or maybe they run a climbing gym or um, it might be a peak body in a different state as well. And we've done some training with some folks in the UK, which has been great. Um, so it's that sort of, I guess, those people who we've been able to reach the most sort of easily. But um, yeah, I, I think it'd be really good to talk to some folks working outdoor sector Do in... Um, do, do you think do you think the marketplace um, in out of the states and Canada is more advanced in um, addressing these concerns with their young people as opposed to the Australian uh, marketplace and the culture here? I think it's um, hard to compare. We've often looked at the places like the UK, I mean the US and Canada, to see what they're doing, and they have these like really great sort of huge queer camps for youth and like outdoor sort of um, programs that they run, but um, I don't know, I guess I'm focused on the climbing space specifically, and I think we're actually doing um, pretty good compared to um, what's happening overseas and that I don't know if there's a lot of, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're sort of like, I guess, on par with what's happening overseas in that space specifically in climbing. Um, let's just say it's super easy to get in touch with a queer climber overseas, no matter how famous they are, because the community is so small and um, I guess it's really easy to just send them an email and they'll be like, oh, it's a queer climbing thing. I'll get involved because, yeah, it's still a um, really small community. Um, but we definitely look overseas for inspiration. I think just because climbing still feels relatively new in Australia in itself, you know, we don't necessarily have a peak body in Victoria. Um, that's, well, it's kind of forming, but we're kind of a little bit behind. So um, we can sort of jump the gun and be inclusive while these things are forming. Um, so we're sort of in discussion with those uh, like advisory groups to make sure that inclusion is part of their strategy. I, I spend unfortunately a lot of time on Zoom in um, conferences in the, uh, coming out of the States and, and the US, which is why I drew the question, the American yeah. Camping Association and various peak bodies. And very, very much um, since the pandemic and everybody's in Zoom, using the um, pronouns quite um, deliberately and and they encourage that um even if they're not um yeah addressing a topic that's uh related mm. to sexuality or, or gender or anything like that and um can you explain that for the for the room um we've all done it this afternoon for our meeting but can you explain what that means and why that's important in the current way that we all work on zoom or, yeah, or anywhere guess, for that matter i guess so um it's potentially specific to trans and gender diverse inclusion. So not everyone uses the binary he, she pronouns and um, making assumptions about someone's pronouns can sort of deeply impact their sense of their own identity, especially if someone feels like it doesn't reflect their gender identity. So um, displaying your own pronouns or doing that through, um, you know, whether it's profiling someone or it's on a document or through social media allows, it's, it's kind of like that invitation that I was talking about before for trans folk to be able to then share their own. Because it can be really scary to sit in a room, like even a virtual room like this, if no one else had their pronouns on the screen, I wouldn't want to be the only person doing it. And so that can feel like a really, it puts a lot of weight on my shoulders to do so. And 
um, yeah, I guess if us as allies can sort of role model that behaviour, then um, it makes it easier for trans folk to say, actually, this is something that is different about me or like, you know, I don't want you to assume that I use he pronouns and um, I feel comfortable sharing that and then other things about my identity as well. Um, I try and make it um, make sure that it's always optional, just leave space for people that are questioning their gender to make sure that they don't have to share if they don't feel comfortable doing so. And also try and make sure that I'm not making people feel silly or stupid if they don't know what a pronoun is. So sometimes I'll say, you know, I um, like to go by they, them, um, and then what would you like me to refer to you as? So not having to use the term pronoun in doing so because not everyone knows what that means as well. Thank, thanks. That's one of the best explanations I've ever heard of it. So thank you very much. <laughs> Riley, my dad would be disappointed because he's an English teacher, but he thinks everyone knows what a pronoun is, but he's obviously wrong. Um, I just have a little question. I don't know if this might be for Lauren as well. Um, what, are, what are we seeing? Like, a, like Outdoors Queensland is about all outdoor activities. So, you know, obviously tonight's generally focused on the climbing aspects with, with what you're doing, but as far as inclusivity across outdoor sector, you know, are there areas that are doing it better than others? And are there places we can learn from? Are there, you know, even in different activities or is it everyone's got a fair bit of work to do? Lauren, you might know, I'm like very climbing focused. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi Dom, thanks for that. Um, I actually wouldn't have a great understanding of Queensland, but we do work with a number of state sporting associations through Proud to Play. And there's definitely um, some sports in particular and then some clubs in particular that are doing really well. Um, a good example would be someone like the Sydney Sixers. Um, their cricket club have been working with Ryan Store, our co-founder, for over three years. And over that time, they've been able to go through many of the steps that Riley's talking about in her, pardon me, in their amazing presentation around um, just those milestones with adopting inclusive practice. Um, one of their amazing events they did towards integrating um, and enacting their inclusive approach was a Rainbow Families event where they invited um, parents of gender diverse children to attend a game and to sort of go out on pitch and get to throw a ball and there was a rainbow marking and we've got some lovely pictures of that that we like to use in our presentations um, and I just think it's a really great demonstration of bringing in a whole new generation to sport that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily see um, so cricket is actually doing really well they've got someone like um, Erica James who has been a advocate, um, an athlete, um, a, a trans woman who's been a great role model for the sport and um, has really worked with them to help create trans inclusive policy. Unfortunately, there are a lot of sports that um, sometimes come to us after they have some sort of scandal. So Swimming Australia, we're working with at the moment and they've got a bit of work to do. Um, and you would already know that from media. So it kind of, um, depends on the the sport we work with um i guess there's this anecdotal understanding that a lot of non-mainstream sports tend to attract more marginalized people so you'll see like ultimate frisbee and rock climbing and these non-mainstream sports as sort of pockets that step away from that rich sporty culture of cis um heteronormative um, sort of sport history that were traditionally dominated by men. So I think um, we sort of see kind of two different sectors. Um, AFLW is a great example of this really interesting coalesce of AFL kind of not really having any out players for such a long time. And then the AFLW kind of come in and saying, well, it's very different um, for women to be out within sport. And we know that there's a lot more lesbians that do come out and um, people in the, the, the women's game versus men. So it is quite interesting, I guess, the patterns that we see. Um, so, yeah, I think Football Australia have come out with a gender target of 40, 40, 20, um, which I think is really interesting. And I'm really curious to talk to them about it. So. Football Victoria, for example, came out and said, we want 50-50 around male and female. 
And now they're kind of saying, how do we make this a bit more inclusive? And I'm sort of like, well, you've kind of, <laughs> you've, you've decided that your goal is binary. So there's a few options from here. We can go back to the drawing board or we can talk about gender equity being part of the picture of inclusion in a general sector. And then you've got Football Australia who have said, we recognise trans and gender diverse people and diverse genders, and they're part of the direction that we'd like to head forward. So those are probably some examples. Um, we're excited about the Women's World Cup coming up in Australia and New Zealand. And I think that is going to be a great place to, to showcase um, in inclusion in the game as well. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. Thank you for that, Laura. I think rather than non-mainstream, we prefer the term organic for our world. It's um... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think that it's that those are, yeah, going on from what Lauren was saying, um, a lot of people come to Climbing Cuties and then they use that as a stepping stone to find them a sense of belonging in other sports. Um, because I think we would like to think that we create a space that doesn't necessarily require them to perform athletically or compete in any way. You know, they can just come along and, you know, just hang out at the gym if they want to make a badge, eat some cake, which we don't always have, but sometimes we do, and then <laughs> do a couple boulders or a climb. And then that gives them sort of, they give themselves permission to be in active sports spaces. And then they yeah. go into skateboarding or they might go for a hike or they might go and play football or go swimming or whatever it is because they've made that first step and mm. if, you know if they don't come back to a cuties event because they found something else that they're more interested in then that's fine because that's yeah. the whole point of the work that we do um, and I think all of us in the outdoors sort of space uh, it's it's um, we have an opportunity to role model to a lot of these other sports that have ingrained long you know standing binary and exclusionary um, policies because you know we I guess we have an opportunity to make change and we can show them how um, yeah what the good stuff that we're doing because um, it goes beyond just um, we haven't been around for that maybe that as long as some of the other sports have <laughs> yeah and just to touch on that um, we met with um, there's a group called Parents of Trans and Gender Diverse Children um, and we had the pleasure of meeting with them last week and unfortunately hearing about how COVID is really impacting a lot of young people and we're sort of trying to pivot and think how can we engage um, young people who aren't feeling confident to move their bodies right now or who might be getting pressure um, if they've decided to uh, affirm their gender they're getting a lot of pressure to, to very weight centric approach of your body needs to look like this so that it can look like this um, and and meeting with sort of those sort of bodies to brainstorm how can we create movement as joy and I think a lot of um, people who have a privileged upbringing with their physical literacy like myself you approach sport and you had a great experience so you're going to do more of it so I think Riley's right in introducing joyful inclusive movement um, we're the same it doesn't matter what what kind of movement it is the and I think non-competitive play-based recreation um, there's no wonder that that seems to be a growing stream for the LGBTIQ plus community um, and then that said conversely with um, we have a lot of trans kids contacting us saying all my all my friends are playing footy or AFL you know I want to play too so some people like know what they want to do and and you're just helping them do it and other people I think it's about introducing a joyful movement experience to prime them um, to go to the skate park to go to those scary places so that they can give it a go. I really love that phrase um, movement as joy and I feel like a lot of people here um, working as an outdoor educator or facilitator like that's like a huge thing that we try and bring um, to people and that's like why we're here is just to like have an enjoyable experience. Um, a lot of us like kind of work um, with you know potentially like young people all the way through to adults. I was just wondering if you two um, could provide us like any specific things for us to do to create that instant safe and warm welcoming space um, and show allyship um, to anyone in the queer community. Um, when at work or just like in day-to-day -day life because I feel like um, uh, sometimes these practices aren't as like inherent um, in people who haven't you know been exposed to them 
And so what's a good starting point? I think, um, uh, I think, I mean, I think I had a few points on the slide which I'm trying to think about now, but I uh, often I'll have people say, um, oh, you know, we're already, I'm, I'm welcoming, I don't, everyone's welcome and um, I don't really care, you know, it's fine, everyone can come to my gym or whatever it is, but um, it's maybe a lack of awareness of how how discriminated we still are because, you know, it does seem all pretty happy and joyful on the outside, but um, if you look up the statistics and the research around the mental health issues that surround LGBTQ folk and trans and gender diverse people specifically, I think a lot of people just takes a few bits of um, educating yourself and learning and going out and doing the research on your own to understand how um, how impactful some of this work can be. So I guess in the first instance, I would, I would recommend um, doing some of that research on your own. And then if you need some guidance, you can connect with the community, then we can provide you with some resources to better understand the, the ways in which we're, I guess, marginalized still. Um, I think one example of, was someone within the climbing space who's, you know, a relatively um, uh, very much a leader and a role model post on social media during the Olympics um, and put up a poll asking whether or not a, a trans woman should be allowed to compete with the other women and, um, you know, then shared the the outcomes of that poll and it, most people said no, that wasn't, they, they shouldn't be allowed to compete. So like that trans exclusionary kind of turfy attitude and this person just didn't, you know, doesn't understand how um, that, that our trans youth are, are dying every day and just the fact that they can't participate in sporting spaces or outdoor spaces could be, you know, one of the reasons why they don't feel welcome or, you know, that just going outdoors and camping and connecting with nature could be a, a way for them to find meaning or a way for them to find sort of peace within themselves or to connect with other peers and just to find joy in life and um, putting up something like that on social media can be so deeply harmful and also shares a really harmful message and it's just came from a, a lack of understanding and I guess and not knowing so I had a conversation with them and hopefully I've been able to sort of change their mind a little bit in terms of you know you can't put up a post like that because it's harmful because you know people's lives are in danger um, in some of the um, which you know is the not sort of nice conversation that we want to have but um, I guess long story short there's a lot of information and resources out there so doing that work and then if you do want to talk to community there are advocates like myself and Lauren that work in this space but not relying on your token LGBTQ person to sort of do the heavy lifting and not asking them to do the training for you there's people that will happily do the work for you as well so um, yeah talk to the people that are loud and proud about it I suppose because it can be a quite quite sort of tiring I suppose for people in the community. Yeah, thanks, Riley. I think those are great examples. The only thing I would add, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, making some assumptions about some people in the room might be outdoor educators amongst that sort of framework, is considering um, the movement options that you're providing people with. Um, I think often in school there's this competitive model and often um, we get praised for the more physically able that we are. Um, I think there's a high group of people regardless of their gender and sexuality who don't move as well um, as what we may or may not consider as the norm within sport and recreation education standards um, so truly thinking about being inclusive I really do think steps away from a model of rewarding the winners and the losers and having the binary team and making assumptions like Riley was saying earlier about the girls over here and the boys over here. It's not easy to do this sort of work, but if you just think about it or even sometimes say, oh, we haven't figured it out yet. We're trying to make this class a little bit more inclusive. So we're going to try it like this and it might, may or may not work. Mm -hmm. I think for people with lived experience of being marginalised in a certain way, to know that you're thinking and you're trying and you're actively seeking help and that mutual aid model of let's figure this out together. I think that things like that can be really um, lovely in, in welcoming people in to figure it out with you because it's scary to move your body if you've been told your whole life that you don't belong with the, the golden people that move the body very well and win awards and do fancy things. So um, I think it's a really exciting time. You get to work with young people while they're learning and growing and figuring themselves out um, and hopefully self-expression 
um, whatever they want to wear to rock up if they're comfortable, great. So there's a lot of judgment, I think, sometimes in those years around what's an appropriate active wear attire and people's attitude and things like that. If they feel good, then awesome, let's let's get this done. And what, what's going to make it um, the best way for you to get this task done or how much do you want to do? Or um, there's this outdoor group that we work with a little bit um, escape your comfort zone in Victoria and it's an inclusive hiking group for anyone I think it it, it sort of it, I'm not sure if it intentionally targets middle-aged women but that's the vibe I sort of get um, and it's sort of saying you don't need to get to the top of the mountain let's go for a walk and we'll stop and rest whenever we want to and it's become this very big company for a good reason so I, I think if that company is booming then it goes to show us that other hikes that might be advertised feel too scary because oh I couldn't get to the top I can't even get out of the car park you know where phrases like that we hear a lot from people to deflect through humor so the more non-competitive um, pathways you can you can trial and celebrate the way people feel when they move their body rather than their achievements I think that's a great way to prime movement around the adolescent age group yeah, another example we have is, I mean, we had a we hosted a pride party um, in Victoria recently and we had uh, a cake, so lots of delicious food and we had um, a face painting station and then we also had a badge maker, like a craft table set up. And yes, it creates this narrative around, you know, just coming and enjoying and having a party. But for a lot of people, those were the sort of the steps into getting onto the mat and then trying the boulder because they first went to the badge maker and then they played around a little bit chatted with someone made a connection and just sort of sat there within the space and then they transitioned over to the cake and had a bit of food felt a bit more comfortable and happy maybe it was delicious and then they went over to the face painting station got themselves you know put some rainbows on their faces and got done up and then they made it onto the wall and it was just like that transition into feeling comfortable within the space and those were all tools that we put in into play which we do at sort of our big come and try events um, when it's free entry and everyone can just come along and there's no pressure to get on the wall or get to the top or even just climb at all because one of the ways we can put in into play other things so that people can start start to make that step I'm just going to jump in for a second and just say thanks very much for an incredible presentation. Um, I've learned an immense amount about a whole range of things, and I'd just like to uh, thank Riley and Lauren for their input into this conversation in the outhouse. And I think, if anything, I've learned that I need to take it into my wider world of education and continue it. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me and thanks, Lauren, as well. Yeah, thanks for having me jump, jump in. I appreciate it. Um, I would also, yeah, like to thank um, both of you for bringing your expertise um, in for quite an articulate and powerful talk inside the art house this week. Um, and also to all the new faces um, who are here today. Um, it was great to have you all partaking. Um, and we look forward to seeing you uh, in two weeks' time. We're going to have... Graham Pringle presenting on um, Youth Flourish Outdoors for another great chat inside the art house.